Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Sean and welcome to my talk uh, where I'll be speaking about endangered languages and the people who speak them. Um, first of all, I'd like to extend a very big thanks to Glossica for giving me this amazing opportunity uh, to present to you today and I hope that you enjoy. So I really like reading about and trying to learn endang obscure endangered languages. The more endangered, the more obscure, the less speakers it has, the weirder the features or the more difficult it is, the more interesting it is to me. So uh, today I thought, why not share with you two of my favorite uh, like personal stories that inspire me personally to um, and motivates me to keep researching this kind of stuff and learning these kinds of languages. Um, I understand that some of you may have seen some of my videos on YouTube. Um, if you did, first of all, I really appreciate that. And second of all, I just want to say heads up um, that this presentation might seem a bit familiar to you. So I'll be going over a few specific de details um, of what makes these kinds of languages so unique and so incredibly interesting in my eyes. And my hope is that by the end of the presentation, you'll have maybe found a deeper appreciation for um, the insane diversity of languages that we have on our beautiful planet. Today, we'll be talking about uh, two main topics. The first one is Hon, which is the language with the most sounds in the world. And the second one is uh, Ket, which is a language uh, native to Siberia, uh, which is related to a bunch of Native American languages in the United States. And it's one of the craziest linguistic stories ever. Um, <clears throat> it's all very interesting stuff, but I do want to mention that some of it is still a bit like uh, controversial and mostly I'm mostly summarizing stuff that is known so far. Um, there is still a lot of research to be done in this area. And after the talk, I'm very happy to provide anyone with any um, with the full list of sources that I used and as well as others for uh, further reading. Um, but uh, yeah, in any case, without any further ado, let's begin. Uh, so if you've ever wondered what uh, language has the most phonemes in the world or the most the greatest amount of vowels and consonants, I have a great candidate for you for that title, um, the Ho language. Um, it is spoken in around the border of Botswana and Namibia over there in blue on the map. Um, it has about 2000 speakers and it's a part of the two language family, formerly classified as a part of the Khoisan languages. And it's spoken by members of the San people. Before continuing, I'd like to demonstrate to you all what this language actually sounds like. If there are any Ho speakers in the audience, um, I apologize for my pronunciation. I'm only still learning. Um. Yeah, so as you can see, a lot of a lot of very crazy sounds, um, and a lot of them as well. So uh, the whole language, also known as Ta, is um, actually a dialect cluster. There are a few different dialects, um, and the counts um, of the amount of phonemes do like does differ a little bit here and there. Um, but today I'll be focusing specifically on the Western dialect, um, and the counts uh, usually it's uh, like what you find is between eighty to one hundred and sixty consonants about 30 vowels and two to four tones. But today we'll be focusing on specifically the amount of consonants, the 80 to 160 consonants. How can there be so many and what is the difference in, um, in counting them like that? So um, first of all, a bit of just a comparison, Spanish, for example, Castilian Spanish has 19 consonants, standard British English has 24 and modern standard Arabic has 28. So again, how can there be 80 to 160 and what is what the difference? Um, so to, in order to understand that, we first need to, to understand the types of consonants that ho has. Um, so the first type of consonant is called pulmonic aggressive, also known as regular consonants. Every single language in the world has these. Uh, these are consonants exactly like you think of them. Um, nothing special. Um, the second type of consonant is glottalic aggressive, also known as ejectives. Um, as the name adjective suggests, we basically eject our regular consonants with kind of a bit more force to them. Um, so, for example, regular k and ejective, regular t, ejective, and so on. Um, and the third uh, type of consonants, which all of us are here for, I'm pretty sure, is the click consonants, also known as lingual slash velar ingressive. So in this language, there are many, many types of clicks, but there are five basic type of clicks. And we'll go over them right now. 
Um, so the first type of click is the dental click. Ah, ah. Um, and it kind of, as the name suggests, you you push your tongue to your teeth. It's sort of like um, when you like tell off uh, like something bad that your kid did, you know. Um, then the second type of click is the lateral click. Ah, ah, which is kind of like how you call a horse. Um, the third type is the alveolar click. Ah, ah. Um, which is kind of, um, you know, like the sound of a horse running or a clock ticking or something like that. Um, the fourth type is the palatal click. Ah, ah, which is very similar to the dental click. But instead of pushing your tongue to your teeth, you basically just push your tongue flat against the roof of your mouth. So the difference, dental, palatal. Like the difference is very subtle, but there is a difference. Um, and lastly, the bilabial click. Ah, ah, but very careful. It's not, it's not a kiss. It's not like a ah, it's more like ah, ah. Um, yeah. So these are the five basic types of clicks. Um, now, before I show you the full um, IPA chart and we, and, and you can like more easily visualize how it's all structured, there are a few other um, properties that are important to mention so that you um, have a better understanding of how all of this works. Um, oh, also, yeah, I forgot to mention about 70% of all words um, in the dictionary actually begin with one of these clicks. Um, so the additional properties, um, the first one is aspiration, which is um, when uh, a burst of breath accompanies a consonant either before or after. Like these properties, they do change the, basically change from one consonant to another. Um, the meaning of the word changes if you if you apply these. So um, the second type is, is nasalization, which is when a, a little bit of air escapes to your nose when producing a consonant. Um, glottalization, which is when it's produced sort of a little bit in the back of your throat. And the difference between voiced and voiceless uh, consonants. Um, uh, if, you, if you put your hand to your throat right here and try to pronounce Z and S, then the S, the vocal cords don't vibrate, but with the Z, they do vibrate. And that's how you determine um, whether a consonant is voiced or voiceless. Now, I know that it was a lot of information, but bear with me. Um, so here is the full IPA chart of the consonants of Po. Um, in red here, first of all, um, these are the regular pulmonic aggressive consonants that all of us know and love, um, just the regular consonants. Um, in blue over here, these are the adjectives um, that not all of us might know and love very well, but they still shouldn't be too difficult for us to um, use. And lastly, here in the middle in green are the clicks. Now, as you can see, there's a whole lot more than just five, actually 43 to be exact. Um, so uh, so in this language, on the very top, you can see um, clicks can either be regular or uh, regular or vo um, like in other words, voiceless, or they can also be voiced. Um, clicks can also be aspirated, both voiced and voiceless. Uh, a click can also be an ejective at the same time, also both voiced and voiceless, um, except for the bilabial click for some reason. And um, they can be nasalized, also both voiced and voiceless. I never knew that was possible, but okay. And lastly, they can also be glottalized. So this chart shows the grand total of 87 consonants all together, which are the 87 kind of basic consonants, I guess, of um, the whole language. But then um, what's up with the 80 to 160 number that we mentioned in the beginning? What about the other 80 consonants? Um, well, this is where we enter cluster territory. Because 87 consonants is obviously too little, it's not enough to properly speak a language, uh, speakers of Ho decided to just jumble a bunch of them together and create constant clusters. Now, these are exactly like they sound. You take um, regular um, consonants, you combine them together, which create a new sound, sort of. And um, yeah, it's a cluster of consonants. And this is a separate IPA chart that illustrates these clusters. Now, some of the easy ones, for example, in red over there, you have the, the T and H together. T, H. It's just that. H. Or um, but then you have some absolutely crazy ones. Most of them are crazy, um, like the one over there, uh, which is 
a voiced lateral click combined with a uvular affricate voiceless ejective. Um, now, don't quote me on this, but I think it's supposed to be pronounced something like this. Ah, ah, something like that. Um, yeah, the vast majority of them are, I don't even want to try pronouncing them. Um, there is a total of 77 clusters shown in this chart. So to quickly summarize, that's 87 consonants plus 77 consonant clusters, giving us a grand total of 164 consonants in the Po language. Now, um, the, like the big question I kept asking is, should consonant clusters be considered separate consonants? In my personal opinion, not really. I think that we should count them separately because again, it's in the name, constant clusters are just regular consonants in a cluster. Um, but the difference between some of the phonemes is so subtle that over years of research, that's how the count got so messed up and kind of it's hard to pinpoint exactly how many um, phonemes there are. Uh, now, before moving on, I'd like to quickly mention one of the people who worked uh, for most of his life on this language and without whom none of this would be possible. Um, a, South a South African linguist by the name of Anthony Trail. Um, he went on, near, on over 100 different expeditions, over 35 years of research. Apart from English and Khon, he also sp spoke Zulu, Tsonga, Tswana, and Afrikaans fluently. And it, like his, his story is, is insane. Um, but when you read about him online, one of the uh, most common quotes that you see associated with him is this. Trail developed a lump on his larynx after speaking the language for a long time, which is typical of adult native speakers, but not children, a testament to his time spent with the language. Now, this sounded almost unbelievable to me when I initially um, read this, but I kept seeing this same fact pop up multiple times in multiple different articles and even a scientific study, which like kind of leads, leads me to believe that it's it's probably true, which if it is, then this uh, then speaking this language isn't just crazy from a phonological uh, point of view. It quite literally takes a physical toll on your body from speaking it. You develop a lump in your throat. So that is absolutely crazy. And um, in conclusion, everyone should learn to speak um, um, because it's a great language. Now moving on to a completely opposite um, part of the world, um, Siberia. Um, now we're moving on to talking about the Ket language. In a, in, a, um, in a nutshell, Ket is a language native to Siberia, which is very, very distantly related to many Native American languages of the Nadane language family, um, including Navajo, native to the southwestern United States. Um, and this entire family collectively became known as Dene Yeneseen, and it's probably one of the greatest linguistic discoveries ever made, in my opinion. Um, I do have to mention that this also is still a bit of a relatively fresh and niche area of research. There's still a lot of stuff coming out about this every year. Um, nevertheless, most linguists in the field seem to believe that it's true. Um, and there is more or less a worldwide consensus that this is a thing. And I'd like to demonstrate um, a few pieces of evidence that I found interesting um, and also some background on the Ket people themselves. Um, but first, uh, to demonstrate to you what this language actually sounds like, Again, if there are any native uh, cat speakers in the audience, pardon my pronunciation, I'm only still learning. Ture ekundinga bisep das konsetam anegas, konsigas ekbangdengal, tam isis banga hisigdinta, kat hai tungal says the ulga. Italam bukote duck, parandis hai bindudis, ture builde budan sagam, da tolong builde buda ulbe, hai bung down to hon da ulbe. Um, yeah, so that's what it sounds like. Um, not as crazy as um, but still um, has a lot of interesting stuff about it. So the Ket people are native to the region along the mighty Yenisei River in the middle of Krasnoyarsky Krai in Russia. Um, and uh, today the Ket primarily live in a few villages um, on that river, with the largest of them being the village of Kelog, um, with a population of about 300 people. And that's kind of like the center of Ket culture today. Um, it's important to keep in mind that this region is incredibly remote. Not a single village is connected to any kind of wider road system that connects with the rest of Russia. Um, and, the, and the only way of getting in and out of here is either by boat in the summer or 
um, by helicopter in the winter. Um, the Kets used to practice shamanism, and the way it was all structured I and mean, organized was very complex and really, really cool. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have time uh, today to really um, dig deep into it, but I really recommend you check it out. Um, but today, unfortunately, there are no more shamans. The Kets are mostly Christian and um, uh, Protestant, um, or, or Russian Orthodox, uh, sorry. And But at the same time, a lot of them still have these house dolls, um, which you can see in the picture on the right, um, which, which represent different kinds of spirits that protect the house and stuff like that. And they're still quite popular today. Um, so a bit of history. Um, the Russian conquest of Siberia said to have begun um, at the end of the 16th century. And in the beginning of the 17th century, um, many fortresses were already being constructed all across Siberia. Um, the first time that um, any kind of data was collected on the kids was in the early 1700s. And honestly, just by itself, it's a pretty crazy story. And I love telling it, so I'll just quickly like retell it here. Um, basically, um, there was a guy called Philip Johann von Strallenberg, who was a captain in the Swedish army, uh, fighting um, in the Great Northern War against the Russian Empire. In, um, and in 1709, he was captured by the Russians and exiled to Siberia. Um, after living in Siberia for about 10 years, he met a German uh, scientist um, by the name of Daniel Gottlieb Messerschmidt, and uh, who himself was sent to Siberia by Peter the Great himself to explore, um, to generally just explore Siberia. Um, the pair seemed to have hit it off really well and became friends because they ended up traveling across Siberia for about seven years together, recording an insane amount of data on everything they came across from plants and uh, animals and any and, and native tribes and everything in between. And one of the native tribes they encountered was were the Kets. And now, um, thanks to a Swedish army captain and a German scientist, we have a list of, of Ket vocabulary from 300 years ago which you can't put a price tag on that. And that is really cool. Um, in any case, there were a ton of other researchers that went through this area over the next two centuries, but we were fast forwarding to the early Soviet period um, of the 1920s and the early 1930s. Um, yeah, this was a time when the vast majority of indigenous uh, peoples and languages within the borders of the USSR uh, gained alphabets for the very first time. And Ket was no exception to this. Um, because in 1934, a man by the name of Nestor Konstantinovich Karger created the first Ket um, alphabet based on the Latin script, which you can see um, up there in the corner. Um, but And also the first Ket um, um, book for children and beginner learners. Um, sadly, all of this lasted a very short while um, because of various collectivization policies, forced assimilation, boarding schools were introduced and the language generally just began to decline in favor of Russian. And this was true, unfortunately, with the vast majority of languages within the USSR. Um, and over the next uh, many decades, all the way up until the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the 90s, um, these languages really didn't get much support at all. Um, so fast forwarding to today, there are approximately 1,088 people who identified as uh, ethnically Ket in 2021, um, but out of them, only about 153 people uh, claimed to speak the Ket language, most of them being elderly speakers. But this number itself, um, like even a small number as 150, even that seems a little bit inflated, in my opinion, because um, according to a field researcher by the name of Yulia uh, Galamina, who personally worked with the Kets in the early uh, 2000s and, in, and uh, 2010s, she states that in 2010, there were only 19 people who actually claimed to be fluent in Ket, um, and which is a very different number from 150. Um, it's just that even if you technically speak Ket, but you've been speaking exclusively Russian for the better part of 50 years, and you can barely string a sentence together, they'll still include you in the statistics. So it's not very accurate. Um, and as of today, there is currently only one school in Kellogg that actually has Ket language classes for um, kids, but uh, like with very limited resources and the teachers themselves not being fully fluent in the future of the language just doesn't seem very good in my opinion, honestly. I'd love to be wrong about that, um, but it just doesn't look very good for now. 
Um, but now we're just moving on to talk about what makes Ket so special. And one of the pieces of evidence of Ket's um, relation to the Nadine, lang the Nadine languages of North America, the grammar, first of all. Um, so one thing you need to know about Ket and also as well as many Native American languages in general, but especially the Nadine languages like Navajo, is that the verb is king. Everything, every sentence is structured around a, um, a central verb. And most, most things, most nouns and adjective kind of are either kind of glued together to the verb or they're somewhere nearby. Um, and the focus of the of the sentence is usually the verb. That's the point. Um, so um, what's unusual, first of all, about ket is that it is a primarily prefixing language. So prefixes come before the word, suffixes come after the word. As you can see in this little diagram in red, that's the base, the verb root, um, just the, the like the basic um, verb itself. And everything that you want to add um, else in the sentence, such as a tense or a mood or an, um, or an object or a subject pronoun or anything else is kind of incorporated into the verb. And most of the things come before the lexical root. Um, so in the world in general, that's usually, well, that's not something you see every day at all. Um, for some reason, when it comes to typology across the world's languages, um, most languages, like not all languages even have suffixes and prefixes, but those that do seem to prefer suffixes over prefixes. Um, and so ket is already a bit unusual because it prefers prefixes. In this map, everything that's in blue is primarily suffixing, everything in red is primarily prefixing. As you can see, ket over there is one red dot in a sea of blue. And then we go over to North America and there's not an A languages, such as Tanacross, Slavey, Chepelian, and then going down Hoopa and even Navajo, which is also red, but you like, can't really see it on the map. Um, and so, yeah, this is one of the, the primary, one of the first pieces of evidence that kind of pushed researchers into the direction of maybe considering that, um, that Ket might be related to some North American languages. Um, the second piece of evidence is the, uh, lexicon, the vocabulary. There are so many cognates that have been found, um, despite the fact that it's been, um, thousands of years since uh, the groups separated. But when you really look at it, um, there's a lot of vocabulary that sounds very similar and most likely has the same origin. For example, the word for snake um, at the very bottom there um, in Ket is tij and in Navajo, klish. And um, this might not seem like much, especially because in this um, table, there's only four words, but um, over decades of research, especially um, if you search up uh, many studies, especially by Edward Vida, who is the leading um, expert on all this, he has lists of hundreds and hundreds of, of words that all seem to stem from a certain origin. And even though in the beginning you can kind of make it, force it to kind of fit your narrative, after hundreds and hundreds, it kind of um, starts looking a bit less like a coincidence. Um, and the third piece of evidence, which is the most um, um, convincing, in my opinion, is DNA. Um, while with linguistic claims, again, you can play around with them, DNA doesn't really mess around. Um, this diagram, you can see, um, on this map, you can see that there's the different haplogroups. The Ketz one, the largest one in the bottom left corner, is the light, uh, like purple one, and the, it's called the Q haplogroup. Um, which is mostly present in the Americas, North, North and South America. The indigenous peoples of those places have that um, have that haplogroup be predominant in their DNA. And when you go um, to Alaska and then you cross over the Bering Strait into the far east of Russia and then further into Siberia, you can see that the Q haplogroup becomes rarer and rarer. But then again, um, where I have that red arrow pointing, that's the like those are the kets, and that's the one and only instance outside of North um, and South America where this uh, particular strand of DNA is found overwhelmingly, like more than 50% of the population. Um, if this type of stuff interests you, I highly recommend you check out 
um, studies and videos by Professor Edward Vida, who is the leading research, um, leading expert on this. Um, and uh, he has many presentations that where he dives very, very deep on both the linguistic and the genetic uh, connection between um, Nadine and Yenisean languages. The conclusion to this is that um, everyone should definitely learn some Ket. In my opinion, it's one of the most fascinating um, stories when it comes to linguistics, and, and it really shows how um, we're all, how kind of it's connected. And yeah, yeah. Um, now, before moving on to the final conclusion, um, I just want to very quickly mention another language, um, um, like just for one minute, the Manx language. Some of you may know that I have been learning it for a few years now, and I speak it on a basic slash intermediate conversation level, I'd say. It's definitely the endangered language that I have focused on the most in my life so far. Um, Manx is a Celtic language uh, related to Irish and Scottish Gaelic. It's native to the Isle of Man, which is a small island um, of about 80,000 people located between Ireland and Great Britain. And um, the language itself went extinct in 1974, but it has since been undergoing a very successful uh, revival. And today there are around 2,500 speakers of them, about 30-ish native, actually, like, like new native speakers. Um, the reason I'm mentioning this mostly is because I saw a few questions relating to Manx in the questions that I received before the presentation. So I thought to just sort of quickly provide a mini intro to it so that everyone's on the same page. A few concluding remarks. Um, I have just shared with you uh, a few stories of a few completely unrelated languages from around the world. Um, and both of them like have a long and very complicated history and each language and each culture around the world is unique in its own way, really. Um, I'm sure we've all heard the figure of that there are approximately 7,000 languages in the world and that um, the vast majority of them are under threat of disappearing. Um, a language isn't simply a method of communication, in my opinion. It's a physical manifestation of thousands of years of culture, uh, tradition, and history. And no matter how small or how forgotten a culture um, or a language is, there will always be people for whom it's important um, and, and that it's part of their identity and who want to work on keeping the memory of it alive. Um, I, am, I still am not really sure what kind of the defined um, purpose of this presentation is or if there's some kind of lesson behind it, but I just wanted to give you all a taste, um, a glimpse of how many um, absolutely fascinating stories there are out there in the world. These are just two that we that we discussed, but I promise you there are an infinite amount of these stories out there and that we should, and I think that we should all really strive to protect them and um, their legacies. And again, um, I'm very happy to provide um, anyone who wants with uh, sources that I used for this presentation. Um, I want to thank you all for um, listening. If you're interested in stuff like this and want to hear even crazier stories um, with better production value, I have a YouTube channel with a very dumb name where I make detailed deep dives on random, obscure, and endangered languages. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Glossika again for giving me this wonderful opportunity. Um, I am forever grateful, and um, it's a great app with a wonderful team behind it and who were very helpful and patient with me throughout the whole time. So thank you very much again. And I guess the final thing that I want to end this talk on is a short statement that I think um, all of us as language lovers can agree on. Um, that there is no such thing as a useless language um, and that anyone who tells you otherwise is wrong and you shouldn't listen to them.